I'm Kevin Devine and this is Devine Encounters. Paul Goldstein is one of the UK's top wildlife photographers and over the next seven days he is going to undertake the fundraising challenge of a lifetime. He's going to do two marathons then he's going to hop over to Africa and climb Mount Kilimanjaro and all of this is going to be done while wearing a giant tiger suit. So Paul, firstly, thank you very much for seeing us. That's the next okay. seven days are going to be a bit manic and busy for you. Just exactly what are you going to be up to? Yeah, it's not a regular week in April. I, was, I did a big lecture last night. We've all done a lot of work on it, the Royal Geographical. We earned a lot of money, about 15,000 for the cause, which was fantastic. And uh, today, actually, you know, I'm here. I've got time to deal with clowns like you. Uh, and, um, <laughs> but it, it all kind of changes. Uh, tomorrow, I, I've, I'm going to get to my physio and then get down to Brighton. I've got to register for the marathon. Mm -hmm. And then Sunday, I run the Brighton Marathon. Well, a lot of people, there'll be 12,000 people uh -huh. running the Brighton Marathon, but they're not going to be doing it in a suit like that. Uh, so she, and it is a female, um, weighs about 14, 15 kilos. And um, yeah, that goes on my back. Yeah. I run the marathon. I then hopefully finish around six, six and a half hours. Mm -hmm. I will go into the sea because uh, it's good for the legs and I want to go up to about here, get them nice and cold, get in the minibus, get dropped off at Heathrow, we're going to Nairobi, I'll get on a bus the other end, overnight flight, mm -hmm. hopefully I might turn left, uh, she can go in freight, uh, and, uh, and then I'll be on Kilimanjaro that afternoon leading nine people up Kilimanjaro. So that evening I intend to sleep at 2,700, which isn't massive altitude, mm -hmm. next day it goes up to 3,700. I've done it before. Mm -hmm. But it's like these amazing, John Bishop, what, the comedian, what he's just done, amazing. Eddie Izzard, oh my God. And of course, um, Walliams, uh, you know, Walliams, I don't like yeah. his humor, I don't like his TV. I like him though, yeah. amazing. Mm, David, you wanna do it with this on your back? Uh, you know, these people, that's the difference. Uh, there's a down and an up, you know. If we get to the top of Kilimanjaro, you know, that's a big deal. It is slightly off brief. You know, mm -hmm. there aren't tigers in Africa. Well, there is a freak show down in South Africa where Chinese sell some tigers. You know, they're living in the desert because mm -hmm. tigers love desert, as you can imagine. It's just nonsense. And it, they can lose, we can lose them in our lifetime easily mm -hmm. unless we do something properly. We spend the money properly. It's not misappropriated, but it is done in pragmatic causes. Uh, what I'm doing this year is, is for compensation. Farmers who live near the parks lose their cattle, they don't get any money back, or they wait 10 years from the Indian government to do it. This way, from this autumn, I hope it'll be done inside a week. They're going to feel a bit differently. You would the same. If you were that farmer, how would you feel? If you'd lost your water buffalo, a couple of goats and a cow? You wouldn't think much about your striped neighbours, would you? I think it's, it's because it's their livelihood sort of thing. Well, it's, it's completely their livelihood. Yeah. They don't have anything else. Yeah. You know, they don't go to DEFRA crying mm -hmm. uh, like those, you know, those sort of yuppie farmers in Buckinghamshire with about 20 acres and a private income of God knows how much. You know, your poor East Anglian farmers who have nothing, you know, they're crying about that. But there's no society for them. So it's really important. It's not sexy. It won't get big ink, but it works. Kilimanjaro is a big thing. I did four marathons in a week in this suit last year. You can't keep doing the same things, otherwise you become, on London, oh, it's the rhino again, or mm -hmm. it's this. It's not at all. You know, this is gonna be a big deal, because I fly back on the Friday night, and then I'll probably be on the physio slab for about four hours, sit in the ice bath. I'm having my wife's putting on a pasta party that night. So, Hello, friends, I'm gonna eat. I'm eating so, hey, I'll tell you what. Yeah. If you want to take this with you, because I've had enough of pasta, okay, you know what I want to have? I want a big fried fat boy full metal English breakfast is what I want, but that's what you've got to do. You've got to take these things. Yeah. And then London. But the key thing, I was saying the downside is the weight it digs in here, all of these things. It's not that heavy. But the upside, of course, especially in the two marathons, is the attention mm. it elicits. People don't, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to the event, but you're sort of applauding people there. They see this 200 metres off, and it is extraordinary and moving, and people straight away get it. It's not somebody dressed as Tony the Tiger. It's not somebody dressed as, you know, just trying to grab attention or a fridge on their back, and it's all amazing, but it's about them. You know, so many people last year when I was interviewed on Tower Bridge by the delicious Denise Lewis, um, later on in the race, it's, oh, there's that tiger, not there's Paul. There's that. It's about the animal. It's a bit like the costumes you've only seen Lion King. They're amazing costumes. They're not making the human, the biped, out to be an animal, but it is obvious what the animal is, so it's not patronising. The person who made this, I, I guided her in India. I said, y you, look, you come out, you've got to see one in the flesh before you even make this thing. That's going to be your wow. repayment. You know, I'm not paying you for it, but that's, yeah, and yeah. she was into it. And she did. She had about a dozen sightings in Bandagar, and I remember her telling me through her tears, 
shit, I've got it now. I know how this is going to be. And, and that's really part of the story, because to, to run with some silly child pure art costume, you patronise yourself, obviously. You patronise the person who made it, but most importantly, you patronise the animal itself. And we can't have that. Because that's what the, really this is all about. The, the end result of this is making a connection to the animals totally. out in the wildlife. It's do, making do a connection by looking at this that you do, but unfortunately that connection can sometimes tie in with, and I've said this till I'm blue in the face, if, if you actually just fall in love with a species, and they're not my favourite species, I find other animals more um, interesting, leopards I'm obsessed by, but they're on the edge, they are eking out an existence, you know, it is so difficult for them to survive. I loathe the thought of not having them, I loathe the thought of my young boys not being able to see one in the wild, but falling in love with it, it's not enough. It must involve the people, mm. local people. Give you an example. This is true. The names are true. Uh, Jenna, little Hindu girl, seven and a half years old, walks about 15 kilometers a day to school. School is falling down. It should be condemned. Father's out of work. Her mother's sick. Each day between the months outside of monsoon, she will see slick four-wheel drive vehicles. Well, not that slick, but gypsies going in with tourists to see tigers. What do you think she cares about them? Not a bit. Mm. That was seven years ago. Six and a half years ago, my foundation started, backed by Exodus, who I work for, and we think, we've got to make this work, otherwise this is just going to be a, another village. Um, because other parks that have lost their tigers are now ghost towns, so everybody suffers. You know, worth, dead, that carcass, per parceled up piecemeal, fifteen to $20,000. Alive, a female, as much as a million. Wow. As much as a million. Uh, okay, so let's see. More, 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 more than that, probably. A hundred million. Maybe it is. They live for 10, 12 years, all those cubs, all that income. Let's think about that properly. So, a couple of years later, her school has a new building. It has new laboratories. It has a perimeter fence, a borehole, ablution block, two new teachers. Okay, her father now has a job because he's not worrying about a giant, in one of the lodges mm -hmm. that has sprung up. There's a new ambulance so her mother can get to the nearest hospital 30 kilometers away. Right now, she can't imagine life without her striped neighbors. That's sustainable tourism in a nutshell. That's how it works. That's what we want to pursue. It's not sexy. We'll leave that to the sea listers to cry their gushing crocodile tears over it. You know, let's get on with some real work and a bit of pain because what I'll go through is nothing to what these guys are going to go through. I think we, we, we've outlined the, the week there, you know, doing the marathon and then mm. on top of Kilimanjaro and things with, with our friendly friend here. But that connection, if people want to help and contribute to this, mm. how can they get in touch? Just Giving. Straight on the Just Giving site. Uh, it goes straight on the Exodus site, www.exodus. We're not keeping quiet about this. Yeah. Uh, we, do, we run a lot of sensitive safaris, you know, all over, all over the world. But I spend a lot of time in, in, Africa, in developing world, Africa. India and you know I've done stuff in the Masamara in Kenya and again it's all about people mm. hospitals you know patrol vehicles all sorts because unless people get a warmth off these endangered species you know we're just whistling to expect them to survive encroachment will take care of that but suddenly people feel hang on these animals are paying their way we're benefiting you know next time poachers come by we're going to give them short shrift mm. next time we think we'll grow some some barley they'll no maybe not you know, they are, they are priceless animals. And changing the perception. You, Education changing the perception, but most importantly, we have to shame. It, it's about Chinese medicine. Rhino horn, rhinos are being butchered the worst it's ever been. For horn, mm -hmm. we have fingernails, that's what it's made of. It's fingernail. This, whether it is tiger bone, tiger penis, tiger heart, tiger liver, tiger pelt, rhino horn, yeah, we go on and on, tiger claws. As regards traditional Chinese medicine that has been going on for one, two thousand years, it has no medical provenance. It does not work. In the country, China, that has so much to do with face, they are losing face. They are being stupid. And this is not a battle with the Chinese people. Of course it isn't. You know, how could you paint with such a wide brush? It would be morally very questionable. It is a battle with their government. And listen, you don't have to look too hard to pick a quarrel with their government. Let's look at executions, human rights, animal rights, ethnic cleansing. It, the list just goes on and on. But they are powerful. They need to be shamed on this one. Um, they're wrong. It's just wrong. You know, if the whisker of a, of a tiger cured cancer, hmm, we that's a difficult one. That. We'd know about it, wouldn't we? Mm. Okay. Show me the headline that says it does. Come on. Uh, this, it's education. It's yeah. a big one at all levels. 
And, and just taking you back, obviously you've connected with the animals previously, before thinking about the, you know, how endangered they were, because mm. your work takes you right to the front line mm. all the time, mm. not just with the safaris and things, yeah. but behind the lens. Yeah. And when you're out there, uh, what was the first thing that turned you on to that? What was the first animal you thought, hmm, I want to photograph these things, these uh, beautiful creatures? I've always had a, um, a particular attraction photographing predators. And uh, as um, many people who know me, well, say they can't understand. I have so little tolerance and so little patience with so many things. But with leopards, cheetahs, polar bears, you know, lions, and um, and tigers, yeah, I will wait and wait and wait. And I love getting a good photo, like any phot phot photographer. But mine are a little different. I sell thousands of them. That goes to profit, um, and that profit goes to concerns. I feel privileged to do those photographs. But most importantly, it, there is something very exciting about doing it. And you know, let's be honest, you know. 100 years ago, safaris, Roosevelt, no, maybe not, 80 years ago, you know, they, they shot them down in droves for research, yeah, yeah, for the Smithsonian, whatever. It's like the Japanese butchering whales at the moment. All we've done is swap muskets for cannons, really. And when you're out there, you've mentioned a couple of things there about patience, having to be there. And some, the photos are spectacular. They are absolutely spectacular. Mm. But what's your biggest challenge when you're out there? Well, if I'm guiding 12 people, that's uh, which I normally am. Are you yeah. still doing this alongside yeah, 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 guiding yeah, yeah. as well? Yeah, because oh. I want to share it. It's, yeah, yeah, uh, it's altruism, yeah. not these damn photographers who it's just all about them or... Mm. Oh, you'll get exposure from my pictures. Come on. Uh, yeah, guiding 12 <laughs> people can be a battle, but it's also quite entertaining as well. I like that. I like doing it all over. Uh, but the other thing I, I love is... You know, if you have a bad afternoon, don't beat yourself up because I'm a great believer in it shaking down. But you've got to be bold. You've got to get up very early. And it's about field craft. You've got to understand these animals. The more time you spend with them, the more you understand them. I'm about picking it and making a decision, a bold decision, a gamble. Because when it doesn't pay off, I actually smile because I think, OK, that's the law of averages. We chalked one off because when it does pay off, you know, that moment a cheetah knocks over a gazelle, a leopard leaps out of a tree, uh, a, a polar bear jumps between two blocks of sea ice, or a tiger just looks at you. Do you know tigers photographically? Yeah, it's important. It's not that important, no. You, you had the tigers look in your eye there, by the way. I know, because I've seen that it. It's that look straight yeah. through. When they look yeah. straight through, it's... um. No, the photographs are important because, you know, I like to get the message over, but I've been privileged enough to be with people when I've guided hundreds of people to, on Tiger Safaris, but to be with them when they see their first one. Yeah. And more often than not, they're holding the camera and I would just push it down gently. And the reason being is, if you're crying and sobbing, your photographs aren't going to be very good. And you want to kind of remember that first one. I remember my first one distinctly 12 years ago. Yeah, I can remember everything about that game, do I? I won't forget it. Beautiful description you've given there. Mm. Um, and, and again, when you're out there, there's also, I imagine, a wee bit of an edge at times because we're, we're dealing with wild animals here. Um, yeah, you'd have to... It's a, a question any interview will always have. Have you ever had a situation? Mm. And not really, not with a predator. Uh, they're much more scared of us. It's a... A situation with a, a tiger, a lion, or anything, you would have to do something so incredibly stupid. Mm. Um, so, no, my, I am dealing with a very sensitive situation is what is always uppermost in my thoughts. If there is a thought that by taking a photograph, being in, in a particular position, that you may be hindering or compromising that animal in any way, you have to put your camera away, you have to get out of there. Uh, okay, it's their backyard. I don't want to be pious yeah. about this, but especially if it's hunting or mating habits, you, you can't be getting in the way. You just can't. Mm. Uh, and that's why people who go on safaris for five days and just point to point to try and tick off as many species, I don't think, you know, they, they need to be... It's education. We keep going back to education. I'm doing that. And if I... I mean, probably like lots of people that have been watching this, I occasionally get my snappy snap out and fancy myself as a bit of a photographer. Mm. But if, if I came across... Obviously not the line. What, what kind of things... Would, Three things. Yeah. OK, to remember. Don't use the word snaps. Uh, okay, okay, you're patronising yourself as well as the okay. uh, Number two, it's photographs you're trying to take. Yes. Lose the thought of record shot. Okay, I want to take a photograph. Photograph implies craft. But most importantly, if you just remember one thing, that moment before you press the shutter, have a little check that you got your settings right, you are putting that photograph onto a calendar. People have got to look at it for a month. Right. Yeah, Think yeah. about it. Gonna have to be a little bit interesting. It sort of ups yes. your yeah. perspective a yes, bit. Yes, ups yeah, the ante yeah, a bit. It does. You know, a photograph like that. That was very simple. The lion and the cub. I looked at it. It was early morning. 
It was very bright, early morning light on the line and the three month old cup, I just underexposed it by a stop which turned the shadow to black. That's, all, that's an old slide, that's eight years old. Wow. That's all that was required. Yeah. All that required. I knew I didn't need all of the animal in, it's still obvious what it is. It's not a difficult shot, but that little moment before, that's, that's what turns it from a, a, a record shot, maybe to an image, but to a photograph. A photograph implies there's guile and craft and feel craft and, and all sorts of thought process gone right. into it. You think I take a, a photograph every time? Of course I don't. I delete most of it. So. <laughs> and there's no such, that's the great thing about wildlife photography, there's no such thing as a perfect photograph. You look at that and say, no, it's not perfect. Imagine there have been three of them in descending ages coming down here. You, yeah. know. you, yeah. you can always improve. Yeah. That's the joy of it. That's the, what makes it such a seductive mistress as well. I'm not bad at the deleting bit, I have to say. I just need <laughs> that's to a good thing. <laughs> but, but that's important. You know, the most important and biggest critic of your work should be yourself. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing worse than someone come around and see my holiday photos. And say, oh, God. And they've always got them in the dining room, haven't they? They're this high. <laughs> come on, do a bit of deletion. And I'm sure as well, because of the, 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 your background, they're going and they're probably looking for a bit of praise and they want to show you every single one. Listen, so you can... That computer over there has got, even probably from yesterday, I don't know, 30, 40 images people send me almost every day yeah. for a critique. And yeah. I will be brutal. Yeah. I will. However, and I don't know if it's a good place to finish, but I, I always remember a couple I was guiding, and there were four of them in the vehicle, and it was fantastic. The, the girl, the, the wife, was, had clearly been given all the hand-me-downs from, uh, from the husband. <laughs> and he was all the gear. Yeah no idea uh, just full of it and wouldn't listen my best uh, clients I take on safaris are the ones A who listen B who have good retention uh, like a journalist or something always good uh, good retention and anyway there was this moment I, I'd, I'd seen this kill up a tree a very fresh Thompson gazelle kit. it meant there was a leopard around it's a female leopard I was quite familiar with her found her first thing in the morning she was under the tree and I thought well you know what's going to happen if she's going to leap it was an olive tree so not quite a low canopy and Probably only about 15 foot of trunk to work with. So you, when she leaps, you've got to be on it. Mm. Good, clean background, background critical. Anyway, I explained what to do this. And the whole thing was 45 minutes we're there. So you're there. You're up early. No one else around because they're in their hermetically sealed, ethically derelict, morally questionable lodges, you know, <laughs> tucking into their 15 plates of nutmeg waffles or whatever. And, and you're just there. And it's just gold. And I said, look, don't mess around. Obviously, you have to take it portrait. Concept, focus on the tree. Drop the... Yeah, I gave the instructions. He had to do it his own way. Anyway, sure enough, the, the leopard springs, compresses, boom, she's up the tree. And then up with her kill. Mm. So the moment's gone then. And I just heard this little choking sound. I looked across that, where I could fight through the swearing of the husband who completely stuffed it. She'd only taken one. And this leopard was perfect. The symmetrical, the claws, front and back, were about this far from the tree. So you could see the clip. It was an immaculate, brilliant shot. And she was in tears. Yeah. If that isn't enough for a guide, not about, I didn't even photograph. You know, I've got leopards on trees. Oh, yeah, I've got one up a tree with a rainbow. You know, yes. what, why would... But to see that... You know, that's just perfection. And she's never going to forget that. Uh, she's taken a rare um, predator. She's taken a magnificent photograph. And what was rather nice is about two weeks later, she sent me a, a little JPEG of uh, their hallway where she'd done a really nice, with a bit of driftwood. It's about this long, about this wide. Magnificent. And that's enough was still me. fiddling about with all the big... Oh, he's probably lenses. still, yeah. He's probably still is to this day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, James. <laughs> Paul, I know the next seven days are going to be yeah, phenomenal it's, for you. It's Absolutely great, phenomenal. Yeah. And thank you for giving us a bit of your time just no, now. It's a the lunch is waiting. Yeah, I know. I think I'll put that out. That might become tea. <laughs> uh, um, Good luck. And do you mind if we check back in at the end 100%. of the thing? Yeah. And just giving, if people want to give. Yeah, go on to the Exodus site, www.exodus.co.uk. Exodus as in the Bible. And if we want to find out about your photographic work, have you got a You'll find it on there. All find on Exodus. On there. Yeah. Find me up on Facebook as well. There's a few on there. Yeah. Brilliant. And what about tweeting? Are you going to be tweeting? No, I won't from? be tweeting. No. I don't do tweeting. Right. No, I, I don't understand it. I, hey, you think I can do anything in that amount of a <laughs> few words? Get out of here. <laughs> well, as the, the leopard's leaping up the tree, yeah, you can snap I don't and know. tweet yeah, at the same cool. time. No, I haven't. I'm grass. I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to that. <laughs> All right, my friend. Good luck okay. with it. I look forward to seeing the results. Thanks a lot. Eh? Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.